Julian Assange has finally spoken for the first time since being released from Belmarsh Prison. Um, he sat in a conference amongst, uh, there were other journalists and uh, other people around that were wanting to hear about Julian Assange's time at Belmarsh and also what they could do to boost human rights. One thing Julian Assange said was, I'm free because I pled guilty to journalism says, I'm not free because the system worked. I'm free because I pled guilty to journalism. Let's go ahead and watch this first clip from Julian Assange. The first time that he's spoken since being released. One thing I love about this, his spirit has clearly not been broken. Watch this. <clears throat> Esteemed members of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, ladies and gentlemen, the transition from years of confinement in a maximum security prison to being here before the representatives of 46 nations and 700 million people is a profound and a surreal shift. The experience of isolation for years in a small cell is difficult to convey. It strips away one's sense of self, leaving only the raw essence of existence. I am yet not fully equipped to speak about what I have endured the relentless struggle to stay alive, both physically and mentally. Nor can I speak yet about the deaths by hanging, murder, and medical neglect of my fellow prisoners. I apologize in advance if my words falter or if my presentation lacks the polish you might expect from such a distinguished forum. Isolation has taken its toll, <coughs> which I am trying to unwind, and expressing myself in this setting is a challenge. However, the gravity of this occasion and the weight of the issues at hand compel me to set aside my reservations and speak to you directly. I have traveled a long way, literally and figuratively, to be before you today. Before our discussion or answering any questions you might have, I wish to thank PACE for its 2020 resolution, which stated that my imprisonment set a dangerous precedent for journalists and noted that the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture called for my release. I'm also grateful for PACE's 2021 statement expressing concern over credible reports that US officials discussed my assassination, again calling for my prompt release. And I commend the Legal Affairs and Human Rights Committee for commissioning a renowned rapporteur, Suna Ivesdota, to investigate the circumstances surrounding my detention and conviction and the consequent implications for human rights. However, like so many of the efforts made in my case, whether they were from parliamentarians, presidents, prime ministers, the Pope, UN officials and diplomats, unions, legal and medical professionals, academics, activists, or citizens, none of them should have been necessary. None of the statements, resolutions, reports, films, articles, events, fundraisers, protests, and letters over the last 14 years should have been necessary. But all of them were necessary because without them, I never would have seen the light of day. This unprecedented global effort was needed because the legal protections of the legal protections that did exist, many existed only on paper, were not effective in any remotely reasonable time. I eventually chose freedom over unrealizable justice after being detained for years and facing a 175 year sentence with no effective remedy. Justice for me is now precluded as the US government insisted in writing into its plea agreement that I cannot file a case at the European Court of Human Rights or even a Freedom of Information Act request over what it did to me as a result of its extradition request. I want to be totally clear. I am not free today because the system worked. I am free today after years of incarceration because I pled guilty to journalism. 
I plead guilty to seeking information from a source. I plead guilty to obtaining information from a source. And I plead guilty to informing the public what that information was. <coughs> I did not plead guilty to anything else. I hope my testimony today can serve to highlight the weakness, the weaknesses of the existing safeguards and to help those whose cases are less visible but who are equally vulnerable. I want to play another clip from um, this press conference that he was involved in or this meeting that he was involved in. This is about the CIA. He goes in and talks about the CIA and how they targeted him, how the U.S. government, you know, the, the free democracy loving U.S. government that is supposed to be all about free press and protecting journalism. And we go after all of these bad, terrible leaders who go against democracy and journalism and free speech and whatever. Uh, he, he talks about how the CIA targeted him and his family. Watch this. President Obama's Justice Department chose not to indict me, recognizing that no crime had been committed. The United States had never before prosecuted a publisher for publishing or obtaining government information. To do so would require a radical and ominous reinterpretation of the U.S. Constitution. In January 2017, Obama also commuted the sentence of Manning, who had been convicted of being one of my sources. However, in February 2017, the landscape changed dramatically. President Trump had been elected. <coughs> he appointed two wolves in MAGA hats, Mike Pompeo, a Kansas congressman and former arms industry executive as CIA director, and William Barr, a former CIA officer as US Attorney General. By March 2017, WikiLeaks had exposed the CIA's infiltration of French political parties, its spying on French and German leaders, its spying on the European Central Bank, European Economic <laughs> Ministries, and its standing orders to spy on French industry as a whole. We revealed the CIA's vast production of malware and viruses, its subversion of supply chains, its subversion of antivirus software, cars, smart TVs, and iPhones. CIA Director Pompeo launched a campaign of retribution. It is now a matter of public record that under Pompeo's explicit direction, the CIA drew up plans to kidnap and to assassinate me within the Ecuadorian embassy in London and authorized going after my European colleagues, subjecting us to theft, hacking attacks, and the planting of false information. My wife and my infant son were also targeted. A CIA asset was permanently assigned to track my wife, and instructions were given to obtain DNA from my six-month-old son's nappy. This is the testimony of more than 30 current and former US intelligence officials speaking to the US press, which has been additionally corroborated by records seized in a prosecution brought against some of the CIA agents involved. The CIA's targeting of myself, my family, and my associates through aggressive extrajudicial and extraterritorial means provides a rare insight into how powerful intelligence organizations engage in transnational repression. Such repressions are not unique. What is unique is that we know so much about this one due to numerous whistleblowers and to to judicial investigations in Spain. This assembly is no stranger to extraterritorial abuses by the CIA. PACE's groundbreaking report on CIA renditions in Europe exposed how the CIA operated secret detention centers and conducted unlawful renditions on European soil violating human rights and international law. In February this year, 
the alleged source of some of our CIA revelations, former CIA officer Joshua Schulte, was sentenced to 40 years in prison under conditions of extreme isolation. His windows are blacked out, and a white noise machine plays 24 hours a day over his door so that he cannot even shout through it. These conditions are more severe than those found in Guantanamo Bay. But transnational repression is also conducted by abusing legal processes. The lack of effective safeguards against this means that Europe is vulnerable to having its mutual legal assistance and extradition treaties hijacked by foreign powers to go after dissenting voices in Europe. In Michael Pompeo's memoirs, which I read in my prison cell, the former CIA director bragged about how he pressured the US Attorney General to bring an extradition case against me in response to our publications about the CIA. Indeed, acceding to Pompeo's requests, the US Attorney General reopened the investigation against me that Obama had closed and re-arrested Manning, this time as a witness. Manning was held <coughs> in a prison for over a year, fined $1,000 a day in a formal attempt to coerce her into providing secret testimony against me. She ended up attempting to take her own life. We usually think of attempts to force journalists to testify against their sources. But Manning was now a source being forced to testify against their journalist. By December 2017, CIA Director Pompeo had got his way and the US government issued a warrant to the UK for my extradition. The UK government kept the warrant secret from the public for two more years while it, the US government, and the new president of Ecuador moved to shape the political, the legal, and the diplomatic grounds for my arrest. When powerful nations feel entitled to target individuals beyond their borders, those individuals do not stand a chance unless there are strong safeguards in place and a state willing to enforce them. Without this, no individual has a hope of defending themselves against the vast resources of, that a state aggressor can deploy. Really powerful uh, speech that Assange gave at the, this is at the uh, Parliamentary Council. Let me actually just look up the exact note of what this is. It is the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, also known as PACE, and it's not an official government body. Um, it does have significant influence in the European Union, in the European Council. It gives guidance. So this council is made up of members from the various different European countries, and they listen to these types of cases, and they ask questions, and then they give guidance to the European Union, to the European, to the various different countries on what they can do to boost human rights. And uh, Julian, after speaking, did give, he did have a, he did, he spoke for about 20 minutes and you can watch the full thing. We'll be sure to put that link down below for you. You can watch the entire like hour and a half long session that they were holding. He spoke for about 20 minutes and then he did do a question and answer. And a lot of the questions and answers were also extremely powerful and important. One thing to really point out, or a couple of things to point out from what he just recently said was the fact that CIA Director Pompeo, he says, launched a campaign of retribution. It is now a matter of public record that under Pompeo's explicit direction, the CIA drew up plans to kidnap and to assassinate me within the Ecuadorian embassy in London and authorized going after my European colleagues, subjecting us to theft, hacking attacks, and the planting of false information. My wife and my in infant son were also targeted. A CIA asset was permanently assigned to track my wife and instructions were given to obtain DNA from my six-month-old son's nappy. 
I mean, this is what our government is doing, targeting a journalist. Julian Assange has never fired a weapon. He is not a terrorist seeking to blow up infrastructure or murder people. He has sought to bring the truth to the public. And for doing that, they targeted him and they tried to kill him. They wanted to kill him. Um, another thing that he said that I thought was really powerful was we usually think, when he's talking about Chelsea Manning, saying we usually think of attempts to force journalists to testify against their sources, but Manning was now a source for being forced to testify against the journalist. This is how dangerous things have become. The truth is dangerous to the elites. The establishment don't want to hear us. They don't want us to know the truth. They don't want to hear about the truth from any of us, minions. They want to ensure that they're the only ones who are exercising power and control over us. And the truth sets us free. That is one of the pillars of the Constitution for a reason. In fact, it is the First Amendment of the Constitution for a reason. And it is because having the truth and a people who can speak the truth to power is how you remain free. And when he says, when powerful nations feel entitled to target individuals beyond their borders, those individuals do not stand a chance unless there are strong safeguards in place and a state willing to enforce them. Without this, no individual has hope of defending themselves against the vast resources that a state aggressor can deploy. And he also makes a really great point of saying, the CIA targeting myself, my family, my associates, this is not rare. You know, this is how powerful intelligence organizations engage in transnational repression. Such repressions are not unique. What is unique is that we know about this one because of the whistleblowers. And it's important to always remember that. It's important to remember that about any powerful country. I know sometimes we want to demonize one and make one the good guy and make one the bad guy. And that is why so many people are so blind to the failings and the crimes of the United States, because the United States has built itself up as a country, the good guys, the good old Americans that are out there saving the day, Captain America. And in reality, when you look at what the U.S. is doing, you see that there is a sinister, nefarious, a power hungry, elite establishment that is operating clandestine operations, suppressing at every chance they can. And that's not just unique to the United States. I believe every powerful country does this. I think it's unfortunately human nature that power corrupts, that greed uh, just seeps in and takes over. It's part of human nature, unfortunately, and that is why it's so important for people to keep it in check, to call it out and to keep it in check so that we can constantly be replacing these terrible, tyrannical leaders with people who have more sense. And that is what Julian Assange tried to bring to forward to the light. And, um, and he was jailed and tortured for it and said that he saw some really terrible things in Belmarsh that he's having a difficult time even getting over. But it's really great to see Julian Assange out there speaking up again and shedding the light on all of the injustice that so many of us are facing. He is a true hero. He's not a perfect person. That doesn't mean he can't be a hero. Heroes are also not perfect. Uh, but Julian Assange is certainly a hero and we should definitely be, especially in the journalist community and really all Americans who want to halt the tyranny of these establishment elites. Uh, he truly is a hero to many of us. Thank you so much for watching. This was just a clip from the longer, larger show that you can catch Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern at KimIversonShow.com. That'll root you to the platform where you need to be in order to get the full uncensored show every Monday through Friday, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Click on that link. Watch the full interview. See you there.